Thank you, Angela. Good morning, everyone. I welcome you all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is great to see each and every one of you here. I trust that uh, the joy of the Lord is your strength today, as the leader Nehemiah said to the people in the book of Nehemiah. If you're here full of the joy of the Lord, I welcome you and I'm glad you're here. If you're here and life is feeling heavy and tiring, I welcome you and I hope you will receive the most powerful force in the world into your life to bring you into joy. If you're here and life, well, is just boring, and that's a more painful force, a more difficult force than we realize. I hope you'll experience the love of God as well, because love is the most powerful force in the universe. And as we experience the love of God, the joy of the Lord is born in us once again. And I'm glad you're here, and we are here indeed to worship the Lord. I also welcome our online friends. I want to say hello to my old friend from college, Jennifer Crowley Rehart in Huntington, Pennsylvania, who said she would join us today. It's great to see you. Did you know we had a turkey dinner yesterday? I thought I'd have a little fun with this here. I'm going to invite you to stand if you gave money to the turkey dinner. And when you stand, continue to stand. Yeah, come on. I know more of that. Okay. If you gave food to the turkey dinner, please stand. If you cooked a turkey or gave a turkey, please stand. If you cooked or gave sweets, please stand. If you donated to the silent auction, please stand. Okay? If you worked preparing during the week, please stand. If you sold tickets, please stand. If you sliced, diced, or bagged vegetables on food on Thursday, please stand. If you sliced turkeys on Friday, please stand. If you cooked or worked in any way on Saturday, please stand. Come on. That's pretty much everybody here. This was a church-wide effort. Let's give God a Thanksgiving clap. Please be seated. Well, they, uh, Lynn Langford, our fearless leader, did a lot of clever planning. And one of the things she did was she bought four, saw that we bought 400 plates, you know, styrofoam plates. And we used them all. Time 10 is $4,000. Now, now there's a little money here and there. Dust got to settle. So I can't tell you the net income. But I can tell you the gross income is right now over $4,000, and we're excited about that. And then the silent auction brought in another $1,123 in addition. And the Lydia Circle said they aren't quite sure, money's still coming in, but uh, as of yesterday, had brought in $1,023. So there's more to be known, but thank you all. And I'll share more about my heart for the turkey dinner and the sermon. It was a great time together. I just want to say thank you. We had a wonderful time working together. And by the way, if you want a pan of that amazing group dressing, uh, our friends will be selling it for $10 a pan. Or if you want turkey, $15 for a large bag, $7 for a small bag. It's been a good time. Next Sunday is homecoming Sunday. We're going to have Clint McBroom from the 1990s who worked at our church here to share. Uh, He was an amazing leader. You don't want to miss him. He did things as a youth minister. He did things that I could not do. And we need him back. Share with us. You know what he did? He got Jim Trout to sing a song one time. (laughs) We have photographic proof. So you know he's a great leader. So we're excited He's going to be with us. Tom Williams wants to share with us about our bell ringing uh, 
effort. So would you come, Tom, and share? And then we will go into our service of worshiping God in spirit and in truth. somebody to the Lord. But anyway, she had all kinds of medals and badges that she had earned, and I've still got all of those. But she always rang the bell at Christmas, and she told me what such a good time she had. And I could never help Mother because I was always working. But when I came to this church and found out that they rang the bells, I've been ringing the bell ever since and it is just so much fun y'all would just not know how much fun you have and it makes you feel so good that you're helping somebody less fortunate than what you are and just you just have all kinds of, of things that happen and I remember two years ago this man came up I could tell he wanted to talk and you know me I talk to anybody and so I started, we started talking, and I told him that I was with the Chickasaw Methodist Church, and we do this every year. But we, he talked for a long time. We just talked about this and that and the other. But he didn't give me any money. He went on in Walmart. Well, I forgot about him. And about an hour later, he came back out, and he said, uh, ma'am, he said, I enjoyed talking so much with you a while ago. And I said, well, I enjoyed talking with you too. And he said, here, put this money in the pot. And he put the money in my hand and I looked at it and I said, did you know this is a $50 bill you gave me, this is not a five. He said, did you know I was once homeless? And he said, I want you to have this, put it in the pot. And I said, oh, God bless you. He said, God bless you, and you keep on doing what you're doing. And I said, I will. And then you have funny things, too. Now, last year, me and Mr. Phil, we were ringing the bell, and, and uh, this lady came up, and she wouldn't put any money in the pot until we had to sing and dance for her. <laughs> Now that was a sign. I didn't know we could do it either, but we did it so she'd put money in the bucket. But uh, anyway, I just wanted y'all to know how much fun it is. And, but what, the funniest thing that gets me is you can't live 87 years without knowing a lot of people. And sooner or later, they're coming to Walmart. And I can see, I can see my friends when they're coming up and I can read their face. And they're saying, oh no, there's that Barbara Pulliam ringing that bell. I've got to put some money in that pot of that. She's going to think I'm cheap. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> but it is fun. It's fun. Thank you, Barbara. All of us who have rung the bell over these years, I've been doing it for about 30 years, uh, has a similar story of, of people who, uh, that you make contact with that has an, uh, a, a profound effect on your life. And so we are four weeks away from Friday and Saturday, December the 1st and 2nd, of ringing the bell uh, from 8 o'clock until 6 o'clock. And the uh, sign-up sheets are on the table by the suite table. And we have several people that have signed up already. If you would, please put your telephone number uh, by your name. And we hope to have at least two people or more uh, for each uh, two-hour slot. And so we have, uh, four, we have three more weeks to, uh, to get these schedules filled. And just think about this. This is a part of our mission work, an outreach that we have in this church that will reach hundreds of people, probably thousands of people over the years that we will never know. We won't know who they are or where they are, but it has an a, 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 a impact, a positive impact on their lives through the Salvation Army. And as Randy said last week, one dollar given to the Salvation Army turns into five because of the volunteers that they have. And one thing that strikes me about the Salvation Army is they have the lowest administrative cost of any benevolent organization. The, all of, their, their volunt all of the uh, uh, employees, all of the majors and, and, uh, and, and sergeants, and all of, the, the, all of those that are paid, including the CEO, has a livable wage and that's it. There, there are no expense, no exorbitant uh, uh, salaries in the Salvation Army. It is a livable wage, and their drug and alcohol abuse uh, prevention and and correction, those programs have a 76 percent uh, success rate. That is phenomenal, phenomenal. And so, thank you so very much. Uh, please go back and, and look at the schedule, and we'll have a great bell ringing time. Uh, Claudette is our honoree this year, and uh, last year was our biggest year, $2,700. Let's go for $3,000 this year. That's right. And, and, by the way, I would like to see the song and dance. I would like to see that. Y'all going to start it? <laughs> Thank y'all so much. And, and I, I have a special place in my heart for the uh, Salvation Army. Uh, I'm the, the 11th child in our family. And when I wanted to join the band at Pritchard Junior High School, my daddy said, well, look, go upstairs and look under the bed. I know there's a baritone there, a trombone in the closet, a clarinet somewhere else, and I said, but I want to play the trumpet, and uh, he wouldn't buy me a trumpet, and so I went by over on, on Pritchard Holmes, and uh, Holmes Avenue is where the, or Mayor Avenue is where the old Salvation Army was, and they had a great band there, and I would listen, and the guy said, well, you, what do you want to play, and I said, well, a trumpet, he said, well, I got one that the Army, the U.S. Army, uh, just gave to the Salvation Army, and that became my horn. But every Wednesday from 4 to 5, I had to stop by there and take lessons for about two years. And there was the most fabulous trumpet teacher there, so that gave me a, a head start, and uh, so I always have a special place for the Salvation Army in my heart. Now, Dave, you talked about everybody working on it and this, that, and the other. How many of y'all ate some turkey dinner yesterday? <laughs> All right, now, I took a bunch and I delivered them around my neighborhood to some shut-ins in my neighborhood, and they were so shocked and surprised, and I, I, they were just very joyful that, that we were able to serve. This morning, we're not going to do two hymns, but we're going to do two praise and worship songs, and we're going to let you stand and join with us as we sing them. We've sang them here, and you probably know them. Shout to the Lord and Holy Spirit rain down. Let's stand.
say what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from there shall come the judge, the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. So we've got a prayer this morning. We want to... Remember to pray for Jennifer Barnes. She's a little bit under the weather. She's not with us today. Also, uh, speaking of things going around, Sean and Michelle Phillips are also under the weather. We had to move some people around. I want to thank the people that stood up to uh, stepped up to the plate where we had some things taken uh, with changes of people this morning. Also, uh, let's continue to pray for our shut-ins. I was talking to Lenita Treherne. You know, in just a short while, Bob's going to be a hundred. Not cool. This is cool. I uh, had a nice talk. And also, you know, we need to pray for people. Uh, some of us are in this predicament. Some of us know people in this predicament. Of caring for people at home. A lot of that goes on in our world. Uh, Senator Patterson invited me into her world a little bit this week to deliver uh, turkey dinners to the family. She takes care of us uh, severely severely disabled young lady and uh, got me thinking about living with that every day of your life. And we appreciate, Sandra, your ministry you have there. And also we need to uh, pray for the war in Israel and the Gaza Strip and also just wars all over the world. They're just very painful, tough situations that we can come to a very peaceful and just resolution in these tough situations. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you for the love that you have for us, the love that was before us, your love was for us and came before us before we were ever even born. And your love will continue on through all the days of our life. And help us uh, to transcend our own selfishness and self-absorption and really say yes to a God who loves just so generously. And Lord, let your love do the work in us that we need it to do so that we will live in the power of your joy and we will be generous people. And we will use our generosity to do kingdom work in the world all around us. We lift up our good friend Jennifer Barnes who's home this morning and we pray for a quick recovery from her sickness. Also, we pray for Sean and Michelle Phillips who have also suffering under some recent sickness. And Lord, I ask that you raise them up to full strength quickly. We thank you for giants in our faith like Bob Treherne, wonderful men of love who are still with us, knocking on the door of 100 years old. We just pray that you bless him this day in a very special way. This is with Senator Patterson yesterday. I just pray that we lift up those here from our congregation and those that we know who are caring for people in the homes constantly, every day. It's an everyday occurrence of taking care of these persons that we love so much. And Lord, we pray for the war in Israel and the Gaza Strip. We pray that it will not spread to other parts of the Middle East. And we pray that this war will come to a quick resolution soon so that there will be peace in Jerusalem and peace and in all of Israel, and as well as all of the uh, Middle Eastern part of our world, those are people just like us. And we enjoy living in peaceful communities, and we pray that the leaders there will forgive, see the way forward, have vision for change, and be able to uh, stop those who have evil intent in their heart. 
and bring about peace in that land and that part of the world. We pray for the people of Ukraine, Russia, still in this grinding war here. And Lord, we pray that these conflicts will come to an end. People will find just and peaceful ways to live together. That they will let go of their arrogance and their hurts from the past and be able to build a positive present and on into the future. Lord, we lift up the city of Chickasaw that it may prosper and do well in the, in the present and on into the future. That we've changed a lot in the last 40 or 50 years, but it doesn't mean we're through. Lord, help us to move forward and be a prosperous, friendly, good city. Lord, unite us together as a church as we are your people here in prayer as we pray the prayer you've given us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This time we're going to worship God, giving tithes and offerings to our Lord. Also remind you, speaking of prayer, if you haven't picked up your new upper room, they are, it's a new month and they're there by the Coke machine and the fellowship hall. Let us pray. The Lord, we give you these gifts and we ask that you will take them and multiply them for kingdom's work. Help us to grow in that attitude of generosity that you have, Lord, that we will be a generous people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning our offertory song will be Let Us Break Bread Together. We're going to ask you to join us on the third verse of that as we praise God together. So be prepared to stand on the third verse with us. And we'll sing the first two as a choir special. <coughs> <coughs> Yeah. 
Good morning. I was working on a, a trick where I was going to change one thing into another, but didn't get it perfect. So that one's going to go on the shelf to come back another day. But I want to talk about something that has uh, incredible potential to change, and it's grape juice and bread. That Jesus teaches us that if we come to him in grape juice and bread, he will meet us here. Now, that raises the question, as a pastor, I want everyone to experience Jesus, right? So why don't I just go out and give these out, like, in public places, you know? I could go to Mardi Gras parades, and I could just hand these out and say, here, take this, you'll have Jesus. But that doesn't work, does it? Because you've got to have faith that Jesus will meet you here. But that is amazing, though, when you really put grape juice and bread together, plus faith in Jesus, it becomes a spiritual moment. There have been a number of times that these simple little things, grape juice and bread, my life has been changed. Seriously. I mean, you know, have you ever like been really mad then you all of a sudden aren't mad anymore? No? Okay. You ever been really happy then you got mad? Yeah? Maybe? You've been happy and then you got sad? Okay, well, I've had to change, but yeah, grape juice and bread plus Jesus. I'm preaching today on feeding the 5,000 from John chapter 6 here in our service. You know, you take bread and you take uh, fish and all of a sudden you've got enough food to feed 15, 20,000 people. Why? Because the food was there? Not enough. Because the people were there? Not enough. The food plus the people plus Jesus made the change. But if we believe Jesus will meet with us, he will, and we will be changed. And that's why we do communion every month. All right, you guys head on out and do some more learning. We've had a lot of fun today. I'll share something. Yeah, would you please join Stand with us and join if you're able. One of the things God is teaching me this year is very hard is in every single situation, if we would focus on our gratitude to him, it will overshadow the bad in our lives. And sometimes that's really hard to do, but keep pushing through because he does come out. I'm, y'all know that I've been struggling with a situation that's been very heartbreaking to me over the last year. And it's really come to a really hard place, but I've been trying my best just to push in and focus on Jesus. He hasn't completely changed that situation around, but he has given me a peace inside that only he can give. And y'all sing this out to him with all your heart.
for the King, except for a heart singing Hallelujah, Hallelujah. So come on, my soul, don't you get shy me. Lift up your song, 'cause you got a line. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shout me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. So come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shout me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got sharing a series of messages this month on God's economy. Before each of the messages, we're going to have a stewardship testimony, and I'd like to invite Katie Morgan to come and share it this time. Good morning, church family. Uh, before I say what I have wrote down, Mr. Tom Williams, roll tide. Okay? There you go. That's... I had to say it. All right. Uh, I would like to start with saying that I love this church and everyone associated with it. And the reason I'm up here today is to talk to you about tithing. People might say that you tithe because Jesus said you should, but as you know, that's only one of the many reasons. Tithing is an obligation in our Christian faith and shows God how much we love him. Sometimes you might not feel like that you don't have the funds to tithe. I personally know that feeling. Uh, one day when I was attending a different church, the offering plate came around, and all I had was $10. In faith and trusting God, I put my last $10 in the offering plate. The next week, someone came up to me and said, the Lord told me to give this to you, and it was a $100 bill. Now, I'm not saying you do that, but that's what happened to me. So, over the last few years, I was a sporadic giver. Now, I try to be a regular tither. Things changed last February when the youth group decided to donate the money they raised from the love banquet for my eye surgery. And let me stop and say thank you to the for doing that for me. Words cannot adequately express my gratitude that I feel for what they did. And also, I would like to thank all the people who gave money for my eye surgery. Your generosity amazed me and also shocked me. Since my eye surgery, I've been very careful to give to the Lord and tithe every week. On Saturday, I make it a point to go to the ATM to make sure I have the money to give God on Sunday. 
because sometimes on Sunday mornings things t- tend to get crazy, but I'm sure that doesn't happen at your house. Now that I have seen personally in my own life what can happen when people give faithfully and generously, I want to be part of that so God's blessing can flow to others. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. We've had a lot of good sharing in the service, and then we have communion coming up. Um, hmm. Uh, I'm going to share some things with you from God. I uh, will probably get through with the sermon about 1130. If that's a problem, uh, you can go ahead and slip out at that time. Then we'll take communion. I think I can squeeze 30 minutes into 15 here as we look into this. But I do believe, I really strongly believe that God has a, a good word for all of us today. And I have been praying for you this week that God would speak through me, or around me, or over me, in our time together. So I do invite you to take your sermon outline, if you like doing it that way, and follow, or if you just like to listen. I want to share with you a question today. What is your mindset about your possessions and your wealth? Abundance or scarcity? Bull. Are bare. Let's talk just a second about economy. An economy is a process or a system by which goods or services are produced and bought. And that term economy shows up in the New Testament as oikonomia, and it can be translated as economy, management, stewardship, or plan. It's used nine different times in the New Testament. Most notably, the parable of the shrewd manager is that word manager uh, flipped to a verb. Or Paul says, I was, a, I was careful with the stewardship of God's grace or the management of God's grace. It's that word. Or in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, God has prepared, God has managed for everyone. Who loves him. That is that term, oikonomia, economy in English. God has given us this. And so I want to put a serious thought to you today and over the next few weeks. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we need to ask God how his economy works. We don't normally think in terms of God having an economy, but God teaches us very clearly in the Bible. He does have an economy. It works differently than the economies of the world. But as citizens of God's kingdom, we are to function within God's economy. Now, if you turn on the news any, any, any time, you're going to hear about the economy growing the economy shrinking. Invariably, on most all newscasts, there is something about the stock markets somewhere in the world that when they're bull, they grow. When they're bare, they shrink. Have you ever thought about this, though? The way they talk about it, it's like when the prices goes down and there's a major sell-off, those stocks just disappear. Somebody buys them. Because they're being sold. I knew a retired gentleman at another church. He would sit there and watch uh, CNN every morning. And whatever company was crashing, he had no idea how to use a computer. He would call his wife where she was at work and tell her, buy 10 shares of General Motors. It's crashing. Let's go. It's the person, whether they have the scarcity or the abundance mindset, makes a difference of how they function. My grandparents, my mother's parents, were very important to me. I spent a lot of time with them growing up, and both of them grew up during the Depression. My grandmother was extremely poor growing up. It took me many years to realize that she was an extremely poor person in her growing up years. So along the way, little things began to make sense. Like one thing, she quit school. 
when she was 15 years old. Because she could be poor and be bossed around by her parents, or she could be poor and do as she pleased. So she packed up and left. When I was 15, I would have never thought of doing that. But how we grow up does have an impression on us. I remember there was a drawer in her kitchen and you would open it. And there was a section there where there were bread ties. She kept them. And you know those bags our newspapers used to come in when we got newspapers? She kept those too. She washed them, dried them, and used them again. You know that little styrofoam thing that's under your meat when you buy the meat in the grocery store? Yeah, she saved those too. And when I, we called her Dan Dan, and I'd say, why do you save that? She always had the same answer. Do you know what it was? Now, when I served my first church in Schumacher, Florida, I, a lot of people there grew up in the Depression, and I observed them. There'd be a man and a wife living in a house, and they would have not one, two of those large Chest tight, not the little ones you get at Walmart. I mean, the big Berthas. I remember one couple, I won't say their name, even though they've gone to be with the Lord. They had five freezers for two people. (laughs) You know, if they probably tried every day for a year to eat all that food, they couldn't eat it in a year. And I'd say, why do you have these freezers? And they gave me that same answer. It must have been taught in school back then. They always said, You just never know. That was always the answer. You just never know. And everybody said it from that generation. Because they had grown up with such scarcity in their growing up years. So let's look at a story of God and God's economy and these mindsets here in John chapter 6. John chapter 6. We will begin with verse 5, John chapter 6. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he asked Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test them, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered, it would take more than a year and a half to buy wages enough for bread for each one to have a bite. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how will they go so far among the many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in the place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed it to those who were seated as many as wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they all had enough to eat, Jesus said to his disciples, gather the pieces left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those that had eaten. So Jesus, and this is a unique, this, if you want to go a little bit further in your Bible study, here, here's a unique thing. It's only in the Gospel of John of the four Gospels, but you have really funny conversations in the Gospel of John where people say something And the answer is really different than what you expect. It's only in John, not as much in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but in John, you get these funny conversations. And here's one of them. Jesus asked his disciple, Philip, where are we going to get the food to feed this big crowd? You know, where? You know, Walmart, Kroger, Rouse's, Publix, where where are we going to go? And you notice... Philip changes the subject and says, it's going to take half a year's wages. Which store do we go to becomes, it's $25,000. You see the shift that took place right there. I think Philip was forgetting, or maybe he didn't yet know who he was talking to. He was standing next to the greatest miracle that ever walked the earth. Jesus Christ, God coming to us as a man, God who was there at creation when everything was called totally out of nothing. And here he's testing him. Now, a lot of people, when they have a difficult run of life, they say, God must be testing me. 
Maybe, maybe not. Uh, I, I, I hesitate to think that myself. In school, we take tests what? To show what we know or what we don't know. So he's trying to help a test for Philip to know who he was talking to. God of the universe. That one who could do more and miracles. You know, I've had tests, I know. Churches have tests. What can we do? What should we do? I remember in 2009 when the crash, when 2008 it actually started, when the economic crash happened. I remember I had been real busy that morning. I met with a prayer group of some sweet ladies who had been watching TV all morning. And they were telling me all about the economy going wrong. And I did not believe them. I don't know what it was like in Mobile County, but in Mo- Monroe, Clark, I was in Clark County, Mar- Wilcox, Marengo County, it was bad. The economy was shifting. I remember talking to someone from Monroe County and Monroeville, Monroe County had four major factories that supported that county's economy. And they said, you know, they shut the whole thing down today. They shut it down. They, they said, don't even come back. We'll pay you through Friday. You're off. It's locked the doors. And the next week, I happened to talk to somebody who told me that his son was a manager at Pizza Hut. And in one week, Pizza Hut, uh, Pizza Hut, Let's see, Kentucky Fried Chicken and Taco Bell, all three closed in the city, all in the same day. I mean, things were crashing there. Um, just north of us, a huge, huge lumber mill had been built in 2007. $270 million factory. They had one accident in 2009, and they shut the whole thing down. It was supposed to be using 120 loads of trees a day, and the company says no. I can't imagine how a company could lose that much money that fast. But they did. So we were at the church, and what should we do? God was leading us to move forward with growing the staff there at the Grove Hill Church. And amazingly, we had a person for the job at the same time. Um, There aren't as many people in Clark County as there is in Mobile County. There's a lot more trees Lots, lots more trees. But we had a chance. Should we do it or should we pull back? We had the funds and we moved ahead for nine months. That went well. We moved ahead for 18 more months. Well, then I moved and the story's over. But we were tested and we said yes because we could see God wanted to use us and expand the church's impact. Well, then Jesus asked Andrew how far the food will go. And that's a legitimate question. How about food? You know, he said, Andrew says, I found a boy with a sack lunch here. He's got a few fish, five small barley loaves. Well, how big is the fish or how big is the the bread? Or there's a joke floating around out there in the preacher world. Maybe it was tuna because tuna goes a long way. Uh, Bad, right? Bad joke. But the bigger question is whose hand is the bread and fish in. So Jesus miraculously feeds a crowd of well over 5,000 with just two fish, five loaves of biscuits, basically, of bread. Now, what if the crowd would have been 50,000? What if the crowd would have been 500,000? Couldn't have Jesus fed them all just the same with only that much food? Because of whose hands it was in. Now, you may have heard this before. Uh, You know, a basketball in my hand, you know, it might be worth, you know, $20, or if you get a really good one, $100 for a basketball. But if you put that same basketball in the hands of Steph Curry or LeBron James, it's worth millions because of whose hands it's in. Our giving that we give to God is an act of faith that we need to put our gifts in the hands of Jesus. So Jesus receives the gift. He thanks his Father for it, and the whole situation 
is changed. You know, every one of us has gifts God wants us to give. Every, every single one of us here. Now, we have to beware, dear friends, of the danger of comparisons. Just because you don't have gifts that someone else has to give doesn't mean you have none. You just have different gifts to give than other people. God has given us all gifts that we can give. And that's, you know, it's one of the things, um, reasons I'm big on uh, calling people and us that we should be giving our financial gifts to God. As far as I can tell, everybody here uses money. I mean, look around the room. Is anybody, oh, no, he, Dave Strange, he doesn't even use money anymore. No, we all use money. And God wants us to be generous in giving. Now, I don't want to be critical of these people. I've never lived under a military occupation by a foreign power. These people were taxed to death. They were mistreated. I think of going up and down the street, and you run into the soldiers of the other army. And if they wanted to take your money, they could. If they wanted you to carry their armor, they could. They had random, brutal power over these people. And I know they were beaten down. But Jesus saw them that they could really, really give gifts. Because Jesus knew this. What Paul said in Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to measure, give, do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to the power that is at work within us, God has miracles he wants to pour into our lives. And there's so many great miracles in the story, one of which is the miracle of the little boy. Why was he the only one in the crowd that had food? Other places in the Gospels, it talks about the disciples carrying food with them. Were they holding back? It says here in John 6, there were 6,000 men there. Well, yeah, men don't know to bring food. You skip that. Uh, but there were women there. And I would have thought the women might have, you know, known to pack a lunch for their family. There's just this thing, when we're willing to give ourselves to God... He will provide when we ask him what is it he wants us to do. A friend of mine uh, is a pastor at Andalusia Global Methodist Church. I want to get him to come preach here sometime. Ken Jackson, great preacher. And we were talking one day, and he was talking, we both went to Asbury Seminary. He was talking about being in seminary, and he took, we took the same professor, Dr. Charles Killian, a real great, great professor. And he said his first sermon he turned in for Dr. Killian's class. It was phenomenal. It was great. And the next one, he got invited to see the teacher after class. And Dr. Killian was a gracious man, but when he felt you were cutting short on your potential, he got it quite aggressive and said, Ken! He had this kind of New England kind of dramatic voice. Ken! What is this garbage you've given me? A few weeks ago, you gave me brilliance. This is garbage. And Ken said, well, Dr. Killian, uh, 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 I was up all night working my job as a janitor, and that's all the energy I had. Well, he didn't say anything. So that day, Ken said he got a letter in the mail from someone he had known in the church years ago. A prof he was actually the youth minister at Del Rey Methodist Church when Ken was a youth there as a teenager. We're talking 20, 30 years of life under the bridge. And he says, call me up, I want to talk to you. And he says, I, I, hear you, I hear you're working. Now, he doesn't know about the conversation with the professor. He says, how do you take care of your family? He tells him. He says, so you're staying up all night, some, some nights a week working as a janitor. Yes, I am. I bet you're tired. Yes, I am. How much you make in a month? He said a number. And that retired pastor said, I'll pay that much per month for you to go to seminary because we got enough janitors in the world. We need good pastors, and you need to rest. God provided. He didn't see it coming. God just provided. And then finally, I love this detail of the story. Jesus gives more than they needed. You know, this isn't 
rationed out food. This is take all you want. There's 12 basketfuls left over at the end. You know, this is just me, but I hope the boy who gave up his lunch got a basket of bread and fish to take home to show his mama. I just, I just hope so. Uh, I know. I'm, I think sometimes I try to help the Bible out, but I just think that, you know. See, two plus five equals seven in human economy. But two plus five plus Jesus, who knows what it may equal. The question we have to ask as Christians, the questions we have to ask as a church is, what does God want? A lot of times when we have a good idea, the first question we ask is, how much will it cost? The second question is, can we afford it? Now, these are very valid questions. I'm not saying they're not. But the first question should be, what does the Lord want us to do in this situation? Okay. Thank you for listening so well. Let's get to application real quickly. How do you break out of that scarcity mentality and live in an abundance mentality? And I don't know, you know, I don't know where you are on this, but I know God wants us to have an abundance mentality. First of all, the practice of gratitude. Angie just shared with us so, so beautifully a few minutes ago about this. Gratitude changes so much. In our lives, Jesus gave thanks. You know, Jesus was going to do a miracle. It says it at the beginning of the story. He knew what he was going to do, but he paused and he said, thank you, Lord. I think he did it more for the crowd than for himself. And then secondly, generosity. This breaks the scarcity mindset. When we invest in the kingdom of God, because God has invested in us, we see who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, who owns everything we have. We are God's managers, oikonomia, oikonomia. I can't get that word right today to save my life. But we're the managers of a beautiful body that God is, beautiful, healthy body that God has given us. God has given each of us a gracious life. God has given us an incredible constellation of relationships we live in. And God says, I want you to take care of them. And I want it to be a blessing to others. I don't know if you've ever heard me say this, but I want to say it clearly. This is me and my not humble opinions. This is one of the saddest stories in the life of Jesus. I mean, it's up there with Judas Iscariot. Jesus does a phenomenal miracle. And so the next day, the crowd ambushes him and says, hey, we want to eat again. It's there in John 6. I challenge you to read it. And Jesus says, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. When Jesus did the miracle of the five feeding the 5,000, it really wasn't about food. Even though a lot of people thought it was. I was thinking yesterday about the turkey dinner, and it was a lot of food. But it really wasn't about food. And I appreciate everybody who thanked me for how good the food is. I appreciate everybody who cooked the good food. I did eat mine. I did enjoy it. But the purpose for the food was much higher than food. Yeah, it was about ministry, raising money for ministry to maintain our buildings, help our youth go on some good spiritually invigorating trips. But it was also about us building relationships. You know, God rarely works in people's lives without relationships. And we had a chance to work together and build relationships all week long. Listen, I know there was a lot in food involved. With ooh, I, I was so proud of the, the, turkey garving, the turkey carving team I worked with Friday morning. Six faithful men. And I touched every turkey. Yeah, I touched the turkey you ate. But my hands were very clean. I, I separated the dark meat from the light meat on every one of them. And the guy's working so fast. You know, my pants fit looser this morning. I did so much walking over the last two days. But a focus for a church isn't to be on food. It's to be on the spiritual life. And when we work together, we build the relationships so that spiritual life can flourish in each of us. I saw so many people grow in relationships and friendships over the last two days. It's been a blessing to me. It's not just about the food. So do you want to have an abundance, do you have an abundance mindset or a scarcity mindset? And do you want to grow in the abundance mindset? 
practice gratitude, practice generosity. The Lord wants us to grow in those respects. Thank you for listening so, so well. We're going to take communion, or we're going to receive communion, actually. The Lord invites all of us to come to his table. All of us. And we're going to, um, could I have my ushers come forward, please? And if you would like one of those, well, I don't know where I put it, those handy-dandy communion kits, uh, they're going to pass those out. Just lift your hand, and they'll give those to you at the appropriate moment, and we'll get to that. But for the rest of us, we'll be taken by intention. We will break off a piece of bread, dip it in the cup. It's a good idea. Put your hand underneath it. And by the way, you don't have to break off the smallest piece of bread in the world, you know. Jesus gives generously. Get a big old piece, and we, we never run out of bread, trust me. Bring it to yourself. And then afterwards, take a minute. Kneel here if it's okay with your knees. And talk to the Lord or talk to the Lord back at your pews. Spend some time with Jesus. Receive the grace of God that Jesus has for you today. Say yes. And if you could, if you could leave a financial gift on the altar. Greg, you got one in the sound room. The sound room. Uh, if you could leave a financial gift at the altar that you could... Uh, just leave a gift to help people. We help people who are in financial need, paying their light bill or getting their water turned on or, most interestingly, getting the prescription the doctor has prescribed that now that they've, they've gone to the doctor but they can't do anything about it because they don't have any money. A lot of scary places people find themselves in. And your gifts make a difference. And I always tell them, hey, you're looking at me, but this isn't a gift from me. This is a gift from the church. By, actually, it's a gift from God to you and don't you lose sight of that we share that so if you would leave a gift prepare to go to meet with the lord we need to confess our sins so let's take a moment of silent prayer lord we come before you as your people and we ask that you will forgive us of our sins help us to be honest with ourselves so we can be honest with you and then when our honesty with you your grace can flow to us lord we're going to pause here a moment and we ask that you will help us see the places where we fall short of the glory of God, give us the courage to name them in our lives. God teaches us that if we confess our sins to Jesus, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. I want to invite those who are going to assist in serving communion or assist us with music if they would come forward. And invite everybody, if you would, sanitize your hands so we will be a step closer to being careful about passing anything infectious around. By the way, these pumps work really well. Pump them gently, or you'll have more alcohol than you'll ever know you need it. When Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body, broken and given for you. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to the Father for it. And he gave it to his disciples and invited them to receive the grace that God had for them. This was blood of a new covenant for the forgiveness of all sins.
typically do, we'll have two communion serving stations. We'll have um, Tom and Martha will be over there. Bobby and me will be over here. We invite you to come and receive God's grace today.
Would you please stand? We're going to sing a short version of our response song as we close out our time together. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Because all that I have is a Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy?